Well, if you've been with us a few weeks ago, you know that we are still into the book of uh, Galatians. This is no less true this morning. We are going to be looking at the subject, the battle for the truth. That might seem like a rather um, daunting title, but in fact, that's what's going on. If you remember the situation, Paul is rather irate, to use the word. He is really fired up. Something is going on in the Galatian church that has caused them to compromise on the gospel and on the truth of the gospel. And so Paul is reacting to them. Paul is, uh, by Canadian standards, um, a little politically incorrect. He's not just accepting everybody's opinion. Paul is taking a stance that is causing uh, him to really sound a little bit harsh like a little bit of a truth bigot. Like you think you know something that everybody else doesn't know. You think you've got a corner on the truth. Paul is responding because this is Paul. Now this is also because this is the requirements, if you will, of truth. Now I know we've covered this ground before, what I'm about to say, uh, but just bear with me and just let me walk you through this because this is a good time to remind us ourselves of these and of course there's others who haven't been with us. Let me tell you the truth of truth. What is truth? How do you know when something is true? Why would you defend something? What is truth? Truth is a description of reality. It's as simple as that. Truth is a description of reality. When we make the claim that God exists, this is not necessarily, uh, well, this is, sorry, this is not an opinion. This is based on uh, an understanding that there are logical and reasonable conclusions that one would reach to make that kind of a truth claim. This does not become, um, I mean, this is something we argue out, and clearly this is still being argued out among people today, and we're not, we're not trying to get into that, but I'm simply saying if God exists, then this is simply just an expression of a thing that is. It's an, something that is a fact. That's all we're doing. That's all we ever do. Truth is simply a claim of speaking of reality. It's a description of what is real. Second thing I'll just remind you, it is discovered. It is not invented. It is never a matter of your opinion. We don't say that truth, uh, sorry, that water freezes at zero degrees because I think that makes sense. We just know this to be a fact because this is outside of us. Truth is found outside of us. It is things that we discover in the world that are a description of the world around us. Two plus two is four. That's not my opinion. That's a truth that we have discovered. And no matter how many opinions you have that uh, are opposite to that opinion, all those other opinions are wrong because they don't coincide with reality. It's just the way it is. This is what truth is. Truth, by definition, is always narrow. It eliminates every other option. If two plus four is six, then think of the infinite number of possibilities of wrong answers you could come up with. Truth, by definition, always eliminates all other false ideas. If it's true you're sitting on your couch at home, think of all the places you are not. There's only one thing that is true. That's the nature of truth. It's not Paul's fault that that's the way it is. That's what truth is like. That's the truth of truth. And so Paul... and. and comes to this situation and he realizes what they're doing is actually compromising with what he would describe as a, a description of reality. Read with me again verses 11 and 12 of Galatians 1. I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You see what he's saying? This was not a truth that I came up with. I discovered this truth. This truth was outside of me. And I see this, Paul is saying, as a description of what is real. This message expresses the only way to find God. This message ex expresses how to have eternal life, how to have forgiveness of sins. This is the message that describes the reality of how a person can be reconciled to a holy God. This is not something you can play around with because the moment you tinker with it, it becomes a non-truth because truth by definition is narrow. And so Paul is up in arms because they have decided 
to listen to the Judaizers. And I know I've mentioned this several weeks again, but the Judaizers are those who have mingled the law of Moses with the gospel of Christ. They taught that a Christian is only right with God when he lives in obedience to the Mosaic law. So they added these Old Testament laws that we studied through Deuteronomy into their lifestyle. So if you were to ask them, do you believe in Jesus as the Messiah? They would say, oh yes, of course, box ticked. Do you believe that Jesus died for our sins? Oh yes, of course, box ticked. Do you believe that he rose from the dead on the third day? Well, of course, box ticked. And so there would be an obvious way that some people would say, well, what's your problem with this? They believe everything we believe. Oh, do they really? Do they really? And this is where it comes difficult to parse truth. And this is the challenge of the age that we live in, where people are, for bo- by and large, with all due respect, very undiscerning and uncaring and very sloppy when it comes to the narrowness of truth. And they believe that anybody who makes claims on any surface level uses Jesus' name and whatever the case, that somehow they're in without ever examining what is being said and what is being taught. And that is what Paul has been doing. He's scrutinizing the foundation that these people believe. And bottom line, the Judaizers taught that the death of Christ was insufficient. It was insufficient for salvation. What we really needed to be right with God is a righteous life that comes by obedience to the law. And so they added a subtle twist to saying they believe that Jesus died for our sins, that he rose from the dead, that he was the Messiah, and Paul goes into orbit. Now I'll remind you from verse 9 of chapter 2, we read last week, that Paul and Peter are on the same page. When James and Cephas, Cephas is the Aramaic name, word for Peter, Uh, Peter is a Greek word, Cephas Aramaic, when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, that's Paul, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. What I'm trying to point out from you, just a little background to remind you, they are simpatico in the truth. They're teaching the same gospel. But something arises within the church and it begins, it would appear, it begins with the leadership of these churches in Galatia. And so what has happened is, Paul has decided to confront them because truth matters. This is the battle for truth. Verse 11, when Cephas, again, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now, what is going on here? Let me just pause and remind you or show you rather, take a a few minutes to look at this word opposed. Interesting little phrase, and it doesn't carry the same weight in English. So that would just take a second here. It means to set against or to withstand, but it carries with it This idea that it's not just standing against them on some uh, peripheral thing. It's to complete an absolute stand against them. It's a 180 degree contrary position. I opposed him. I took the exact opposite position. He said black, I say white. He said up, I say down. Whatever metaphor you want to put in there. This is the antithesis. I'm not sure, but I think our Greek word antithesis comes from this Greek word, this opposition. That's the strong idea. This is not just, well, I had a disagreement with him. That's the context here. Paul is, if I can use the word livid, something has raised his ire. Verse 11 again, when Cephas and I came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Let's stop there for a moment. What's the big deal he was eating with the Gentiles? Jewish people are raised with dietary laws. We saw those in the book of Deuteronomy. You're familiar with them in the Old Testament. Do not uh, eat certain foods. Um, do not mi- mingle uh, young goat meat and, and milk and dairy and all these kinds of things. This is how they lived. They lived by strict dietary rules. So uh, they would not ever, ever eat with a Gentile because Gentiles didn't have these rules. So you never knew if you sat down with a Gentile what was kosher, what was not. They wouldn't even use the same utensils. This was just forbidden. It was almost a built-in bigotry into the Jewish lifestyle, believing that avoiding these things somehow made them holy and being with Gentiles contaminated them. So here's what's going on. Before these men came, 
Peter is seen eating, a Jewish man eating with Gentiles. What does that tell you? Peter recognizes that in Christ, all of those laws have been fulfilled. Peter has lived a lifestyle. I think it's Acts chapter 10. You can proof text me on that if you want, where he saw a vision of a sheet that came down and all these animals and he was told kill and eat. And he realizes that all animals, all food is from God. So here's Peter now enjoying his, you know, ice cream and bacon bits and whatever he's got going there. And he's just mowing down on a pork sandwich and suddenly Something has changed. He was once eating with the Gentiles. Let's keep reading the text. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Here's the deal. Peter is now acting out of fear. He is responding to a social situation and now he's compromising and he's now taking on, stepping back into the lifestyle of being a Jew because of the presence of these Judaizers in the church. He doesn't want to make trouble, it would seem. They have raised up a fear in him. Now, this is easy to come down on Peter and somehow think that, you know, he's, you know, just be harsh about it. But this is Peter. We know he has this personality of waffliness. We've seen this in him. This is just his personality coming out. He struggles like you struggle with your flesh to stand up for what is right. And he is afraid now of the social dynamic that is caused if he speaks up. It would appear that he is afraid that this is going to show up on Facebook and he is going to be scorched and, and flamed and he is going to be publicly humiliated and this might ruin his reputation and he doesn't want to be a troublemaker and these people have some sway and what are they going to say against him and how might they spread words of him eating with Gentiles and what might that do to his, his reputation? He's an apostle after all. And so out of a social concern for himself... He compromises on truth. And I can tell you very plainly that this is the same position that the church is in today. That there are many churches who have bowed to the social pressure. We all feel this social pressure. It is a challenge. There is no question it is difficult. Nobody's saying this is easy. Nobody's saying this is fun. But truth, by definition, requires that we stick to the truth. And that narrows very quickly, everything else is wrong. That's just the way it is. So you sound like a truth bigot. You sound like you're arrogant. You sound like you think you've got the corner on all things. You think that you, all their ways are wrong and you're just so, you know, whatever dastardly thing, you names you want to be called. This is the kind of social situation that Peter is fearing. And Peter has compromised. Let me keep reading with you. Verse 13. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So Peter goes back out of the fear. Out of, afraid, of being afraid to stand up for truth and hold this ground. He compromises with the gospel. And his tacit response becomes his silent agreement with their teaching and what happens the his leadership now influences the other le other leaders in the church and the entire church is now responding oh peter's doing that i guess that's how we should be well welcome to this to the position of trying to be a leader in a world that says that all truth is equal and that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth welcome to the world of trying to stand up for what is right this is exactly what took place as he took a step back he influenced the entire body. And this suddenly wasn't just an issue of a personal issue. This suddenly became the entire church was being steered in the wrong direction. And Paul steps in and he is firing all guns ablazing. Now, 
No sermon would be complete without at least some point in it that a quote comes from Martin Luther. If you know Martin Luther, uh, he lived just over 500 years ago, and of course he fired up the Reformation. If you're not familiar with the name, do some searching on some church history. Here is just a quote. You are not only responsible for what you say, but, for, but also for what you do not say. And I think that applies here. This is the situation that Peter has been silent. And Peter has not said anything. And in doing so, he has now been a poor leader to his people. So keep reading verse 14. When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Let's pause there. This phrase of being in step. Interesting little word. Not that intriguing, I guess, but it's a compound word, orthopedeo, which is where we get our English word orthopedics, comes from two Greek words, orthos means straight, and pous means foot, and it means literally to walk straight, to be properly straight-footed. It carries with it in this context the idea of walking in a straight path, walking in conformity to God's truth. Peter has taken a crooked path, Peter has taken the road less traveled. And Paul comes along and says, look, you have not stayed or your foot on this narrow path. You have stepped off and gone in a different direction. Sure, he's probably not saying that this was um, uh, uh, not easy to do, but he is responding to this. Let's read these verses again. When I saw that their contact was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, Live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, obviously, Paul is upset. If you're a Jew and you've been living this lifestyle of sitting down, eating with Gentiles, eating their food, not obeying all these Old Testament laws, now all of a sudden, just like that, you turn the corner and now you're telling this Gentile church that they need to come under the law? Don't you know he's about to make an argument? Don't you know how impotent the law is, he is now drawing attention to how foolish this kind of thinking is. It's not only wrong-headed because it steps off the path of truth, but because there's no validity to it. There's no reality in it. And he's about to try and demonstrate that for uh, Peter's sake. Now, I mentioned that Martin Luther, I quoted him once, and I thought, thought, you know, if one quote is good, two must be better. So here's another quote from Martin Luther. A lie is a snowball. The further you roll it, the bigger it becomes. And that is what Paul is trying to keep from happening. This false idea has taken root in Peter's heart. It is spilling over into the church. They are starting to recognize or starting to, you know, compromise and say, well, they believe most of the same stuff as us. Well, they're pretty close. Now, can I just remind you, I just want to pause here and remind you of something very, very important. Okay, this is about truth. Okay, I just have to say this so you understand me clearly. This is about truth. This is not an attack ever, an attack on people. This is an attack on ideologies, on ideas, on things that are taught. This is not about the people that teach them. We're never against people. We're against wrong ideas that are taught. That is what we stand for. The truth. We, are, we do not hate, can I say this? We do not hate Muslims, but the truth of the, 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 the sorry, the theological teachings of Islam directly contradict the gospel of Christ. What are you going to do with that? You're going to say, well, they're both right. They contradict each other. One, is, one has to be, by definition, one has to be white, right and one has to be wrong. And if you're going to plant your flag in the sand somewhere and stand for what you believe to be true, then you're standing against an idea that is false, by definition. So this is not about, if I can try to make this clear, this is not a, rail, a railing against a people group or, or a religion. It's about truth. And that is what Paul is responding to. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. This is a beginning of his argument to Peter as to why this position that he's taken carries no weight. And he begins by pointing out strange little phrase. We are Jews by birth, meaning we were born under this, the restraints of the law. He's now going to point out the failings of the law to restrain your own flesh. 
And he's pointing out, look, we were raised in the confines of a Jewish culture that taught us what to do on a Saturday night to put the lights out and what to do, or sorry, excuse me, Friday night and how, how to live on Saturday and what we did with our food and what we touched and when we went to the temple and what we did and didn't do and who we were with and all of these confines. We lived with religion. And you know and I know that that religion did nothing to bring you to God. It's ultimately what his argument is going to be. You know that because you came to Christ. You recognized that, that, that the, 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 the law was not competent, was not potent enough to save you. We were Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. We didn't, weren't born with this freedom to just go and do whatever we want and live however we want and be as immoral as we want without any restraints because we were born with the constraints of Jewish laws. But did those Jewish laws actually hold your flesh at bay? Do you remember Nicodemus came to Jesus, who was a very strict obedience, uh, living in obedience to the law, and yet he asked, how do I get into the kingdom of God? He recognized that his keeping of the law was not sufficient. We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ. So we have also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This is clearly one of the most important verses, not only in the New Testament in regards to our salvation, but clearly the book of Galatians. This is a touchstone uh, area of uh, doctrine and context. This is um, the place where Paul begins to outline the narrowness of truth. And he uses this word three times, justified. I've highlighted it so you can see it there. I'm sure you're familiar with this word. It's not unfamiliar to you. If you're a believer, it means to show righteous, to declare righteous. It is used in a legal sense. It's often used in a a courtyard or a courtroom and that kind of a, a scenario where a judge pronounces you justified. It means it's used especially in a legal and an authoritative sense to show what is right is what it means. I eat that is to conform to a proper standard. It is the opposite of the word condemnation. So this is a, a judgment call that God in his mercy has declared sinners to be scot-free, having no bearing upon their previous life, having no bearing upon um, how obedient they were to the law, recognizing that the law and its efforts only just showed us how far we were from ever being able to keep the law. Everyone who comes and recognizes their shortcomings in being a good person, that these are the ones who come and they are pronounced justified. Read this text again. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. This is the scandal of the gospel. This is the narrowness of the gospel. There is only one way to God. And it is through justification by faith in Christ and Christ alone. And when we tamper with that, when we add to that, when we tinker with that, we're messing with the truth that has been revealed outside of us that we discovered in the gospel that has been given to us by God himself that is narrow in focus because that's what truth is and it is the way to salvation. We are justified not by the works of the law. The scandal of this is that people rail against this idea when they say, but I'm a good person. I've never been to prison. I recycle. I, I, I adopted a pet from the Humane Society. I know what it is to be kind to children. I made a casserole for my neighbor who was sick. I, I'm nice. What do you mean uh, my works mean nothing? Well, I don't know what to tell you, except that's what it is. Your works mean nothing. Because you are not justified by your works. You are justified only and totally by faith in Christ. And this scandal 
still raises people's ire today. Well, if one quote from Martin Luther was good and two was better, three must be off the charts. The scholastics explain the way of salvation in this manner. Scholastics are those theological teachers of his day. When a person happens to perform a good deed, God accepts it as if a, as a reward for the good deed. God pours charity into that person. They call it charity infused. This charity is supposed to remain in the heart. They get wild when they are told that this quality of the heart cannot justify a person. How are we justified? Not by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ. It is through faith of coming to recognize that what took place on the cross as we gather around the Lord's table this morning will be reminded again that that is alone our sufficiency. That me in my humble sinful state will never please or appease the holiness of God. I need a borrowed righteousness. I need a borrowed perfect life to be credited to my account. And that is exactly what Christ did. He came and lived that perfect life. He died for the punishment that we deserve for our sins. He took the wrath of God upon himself. God's wrath is satisfied in the death of Christ. I believe that what he has done is sufficient for me. And by faith, I now recognize my justification before God. This has nothing to do with our feelings. This has everything to do with a legal declaration. When we believe by faith in the gospel of Christ, we know we are justified. Let me quote again, Martin Luther. When the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, Tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. Bottom line, we're justified by faith in Christ. And it's not about how you feel, whether you feel saved or whether you feel good enough. Christ himself has paid our sin debt. And when we look to him, this is alone the means by which we know that we are justified. We are declared righteous. Verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor on the surface. These verses can sound rather confusing and a little bit, um, yeah, puzzling. If I endeavor to be justified in Christ, what is he saying here? He is now recognizing that people will respond to this idea that you don't have to be good to be saved. Well, then why would I be good at all? Why don't I just go do whatever I want to do? and then believe in Jesus, and then be forgiven, and then just do what I want. Now he's responding to that. If I try to be justified in Christ, if I declare myself to be that Christ is my savior, and I'm declaring myself justified because of him, does that mean that we've been found, and we've been found to be sinners, and is Christ then leading us into sin? Absolutely not. Christ is not doing this to now give us freedom to live in sin. No, 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 no. If I now rebuild what I once tore down, if I now go back and live that sinful life that I declared to be ungodly and unholy, and I jettisoned when I came to Christ, then I just prove myself to be a sinner and not be in Christ. That's what he's saying. Christ does not give us the freedom to live in sin. He gives us the freedom to live outside of the law. Christ is the fulfillment of the law and he fulfills his law in us by the love of Christ in our lives. And that's what Paul goes on to express in these tremendous verses as he closes this chapter. Very famous verses of Paul. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. This is a theological um, statement that 
would take far deeper in this whole text. I'm so glossing over this tremendously rich uh, truth that is about to be expressed in these famous words of Paul. I'm, I, you know, I feel sort of bad that I'm being so glib about this, but let me just carry the truth and take this with you. If you're still, if you're still tracking with me. Through the law, I died to the law. What is he saying? When Christ died, I died. That's my power. When Christ was raised, I was raised. That's how I fulfill the law. I can never meet the requirements of the law. But Christ has given me a death to my sin, to myself. He has now empowered me to live that law out in my heart and in my flesh. I have been crucified with Christ, these famous words. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is Paul saying? I'm dead, but I'm alive. I'm alive, but I'm dead. I actually, interestingly enough, I was listening many years ago. I was uh, listening to a, a religious sort of discussion on CBC radio, which tells you a lot. And um, they came to this verse and the person, the, the commentator the, was asking this guest what these verses meant. And they were absolutely buffaloed, completely confused. What is Paul talking about? I don't know what Paul's talking about. He said, I'm crucified. I'm alive. I don't live, but I live. This is just Paul is, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is clearly someone who doesn't understand life in Christ. Anybody who reads this verse as a believer, you resonate at some point with what is going on. You are dead to your sin and yourself. And the power of Christ has been raised in you. You're not alive. Christ is alive in you. And the life that you physically live is an outflow of Christ helping you to keep the law. Sure, you're not perfect. But your trajectory is to righteousness because Christ is in you. Your trajectory is towards holiness because Christ is in you. If that's not the case, you've not been justified. Paul has come down on Peter for compromising with the plain truth of the gospel because going under the law has no power to ever cause you to live a righteous, holy life. The only way is to be justified in Christ, that Christ himself would infuse his righteousness in your heart, that his power and resurrection power would be shown in you, that you could live out the calling of the law, the moral law would be seen in your life. Let's finish this text. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. That's his argument back to Peter. Why are you going back under the law? The law does nothing to empower you. And if the law was important, then why in the world did Jesus die? So your logic is flawed. Clearly, Peter you need to be rebuked, he says. You've stepped off the path because truth with the gospel is narrow by definition. I didn't make this up. It came from outside of me. It came from Christ himself. We need to stay to the truth, stay the course of truth and preach the truth of Christ crucified and faith in Christ alone without any add-ons. This is not an attack on people. It is clarifying and hanging on to the truth of the gospel because any other message has no power to save. This is the book of Galatians.